Um, so anyway, so my name is Eric. Um, I'm the kids pastor at Westgate Chapel in Edmonds, which is just about 20 minutes up the road. Um, just to give you a quick idea of kind of my musical background, um, I was that I was that kid um, that uh, that like middle school kid that was back in the sound booth, not paying attention, but like you know wanting to serve and help in kids ministry. So I grew up in the church, grew up serving in kids ministry. And when I was 16, um, I started playing guitar, and I and I asked my kids person, "Hey, like I just learned guitar," and I bet he's like, "Oh no." Um, I'm like, could I like, could I play for kids church sometime? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. And he let me play for like a response time. And it, was, it was awful. It was terrible. Um, but I was like, oh, this is, this is awesome. Um, and kind of from that moment, I, I've really had this kind of bent towards kids and towards worship. Um, because I think a lot of times that's, that's sometimes a, the really overlooked. And beyond just worship, we're going to talk about way more than worship today. I think just music in general, there's, there's a ton of um, potential just in the power of music that I think um, we're under, that I'm even still underutilizing in our church. Um, so anyway, just so I have an idea, just pop your hand up if you're involved in like music or worship or anything kind of at, at your church. Okay. Okay, so we've got a mixed crowd here, but it'll be good, and I think a lot of these things will, will apply to, to everybody in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says something really interesting um, about music. He says, music will help dissolve your perplexities and purify your character and sensibilities, and in time of care and sorrow, will keep a fountain of joy alive in you. I don't know about you guys, but I, I've, I've discovered that to be true in my own life. Um, so what? So how we're going to approach this? Like I said, I want to leave some time at the end for discussion because I think there's some things we can learn from each other, and there might be some things we want to process. Um, but first, we're gonna we're gonna figure out. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about why I say that there's a lot of power in music, and I and I think we're not using it to its fullest potential. And then we'll talk about specific contexts within our ministries that we can use it. So in environment, like our hallways and environments, um, in our connection points with parents, um, in our worship, um, in service, and some some other kind of practical ways that we can can put this into practice. So um, I think. Before we go on, we have to kind of all agree that music is a universal language. Um, it doesn't matter what, you know, what language you speak, what nationality you're from, what color your skin is, is you can walk in a room and be like, oh, yeah, you know, this is, you know, you can walk into Disneyland and be like, oh, this is a happy, fun place, right? And because the music kind of sets the tone, you almost hear that before you get all the way into the park. Um, and so, so, uh, that, that's why I say music is universal language. I've never met a single person on earth that doesn't like music in one way, shape, or form. Um, and if Martin Luther says something, he said something in a prelude, um, I, I think to some uh, musical thing. Um, I love this. He says, um, <coughs> a person who does not regard music as a marvelous creation of God must be a clodhopper indeed. Um, <coughs> yeah, well, we could go on from there, but that he just... Uh, we should bring Claude Hopper back into our vocabulary. Um, so um, we all know that music impacts us in a greater way than just our ears, right? Music, you know, you can be watching a movie or maybe there's some um, uh, sentimental value that you have attached to a song and it, it generates far more than just a pleasant sound. It can generate emotions, it can generate feelings, it can bring back memories. There have been some really interesting studies done on how um, music can help Alzheimer's patients. Uh, really, the, I think there's this whole, whole vast kind of impact that music can have with our kids um, that, that, like I said, we're going to be talking about. Um, so here, here's the meat and potatoes. When I found this study, this, this kind of changed the way that I thought about music and I thought about worship um, in the context of church. Um, it was a study done by um, some psychologists uh, who study uh, neuroscience of music. I didn't even know that was a thing. The Neuroscience of Music at McGill University in Montreal. And I'm just going to read a brief excerpt from our study that's kind of the jumping off point um, for us. Uh, the study said, among participants, the researchers found synchronization in several key brain areas and similar brain activity patterns in different people who listen to the same music. This suggests that the participants not only perceive the music the same way, 
But despite whatever personal differences they brought to the table, there's a level on which they share a common experience. Uh, so that's why I say music is a universal language, right? Um, here's the kicker. Brain regions involved in movement, attention, planning, and memory consistently showed activation when participants listened to music. Okay, catch that. Let me, let me round. Essentially what this is saying is, Way more is happening in our body and in our mind. Way more is being engaged than just our ears when there's when there's music present. Okay, so they said they found synchronization in um, and similar brain activity patterns uh, in uh, movement, attention, planning, and memory. They say uh, these are the structures that don't have to do with auditory processing itself. This means that when we exp when we experience of music, a lot of other things are going on beyond merely processing sound, okay? So it's from this kind of foundation in this study that I said, okay, there, there's, there's a way to really use and leverage music um, within, within kids' ministries. So let's talk about a couple, of, a couple practical ways and a couple practical areas that we can use it. Okay, first of all, environments. How do you guys use, let me ask you this, how do you guys use or do you use any sort of music in your environments, in your hallways, Etc. So forth. What What do you guys do? Okay. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Have you have you ever oh, go ahead? It was like the uh, rhythm song of the holiday celebration. Okay. Really helped like to give the guys a little bit of a yeah. Speed up the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. It really is interesting how music can set an expectation in the room, right? How, you know, if you're doing response stations at the end of a message that has a really soft ending and you want the kids to just be able to kind of sit and pray and interact with whatever you have set up, you know, you're not going to play like a planet shaker. like da, 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 because the kids are like, they don't know what to do because they're saying one thing, but they're like, the music is telling me something different. Um, so so um, music, really exactly what you said, music, it helps helps us as adults even kind of understand how to how to interact and connect with the situation. Yeah. 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 Can you imagine? Can you imagine what your Sunday would look like if you didn't have any music at all anywhere? That'd be so dead and so boring and so bland. There have been Sundays where we've we've had like because we play background music when the kids are coming in, um, where it hasn't gotten turned on in time, or like we had a major you know technical issue and we just couldn't get it working for that morning, and it's just like. I just feel so uncomfortable. It's like uh, whatever that, I can't remember the name of the movie, uh, where Will Ferrell's getting interviewed, and he's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. I'm just like, yeah, ah, get some music going. Um, because it really does help. I think actually it should be a federal law that all public ba restrooms should have music playing in the background. Um, that would just make my life just so much less awkward. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> that's very that's very true. Um, so environment. So if um, uh, and this can be as simple as you making a mix CD and putting it in a CD player and throwing it out in the hallway um, or nestling it behind. You know, we have an, an invasion of fake trees uh, at our church that we can't seem to shake. They always come back um, from wherever we hide them. So but great place to hide a CD player. Um, and, and it makes a huge difference because it helps. Um, Music shapes people's perceptions of things. Um, and so when parents come, especially first-time parents or, or newer parents and families that come, they're like, oh, this is a fun place, right? My kid will love this. Um, just be, just on, on the merit of music alone. 
Um, I think if I had the choice, if, if, so, if you know, my executive pastor came to me and said, hey, listen, uh, we want to help you do remodel, but we either have, we can either, you can either paint everything however you want to, or we'll like wire all your hallways and everything for sound. I would take the sound instead of the paint because I think sound paints areas better than paint does. I'd rather take white walls and great music than colorful place and, and no music at all. Um, so, um, teaching aids. Uh, Benjamin Franklin um, says this is a really significant thing for kids' ministry. Um, he said, Tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. And when I think back to what to that what I, what that little snippet I read of that study, right? When we talk about music, you want to talk about involving someone, right? Because it clicks with so many other different areas of our brains than just auditory, right? And you might say, "Oh, music's great for auditory learners." Yes, but it's way more than that because it clicks with with really with all the learning styles because it's engaging so many different parts of the brain. Um, something, uh, okay. <laughs> Great example, the alphabet song. To this day, to this day, I cannot alphabetize things without singing the alphabet song under my breath, <laughs> right? And like, oh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And I'm a little embarrassed about it, so it's like, <laughs> oh, that's where it goes. Um, but like that, that was such a huge thing for me. It really helped me learn and helped me remember. And when I think back to growing up in kids, uh, you know, kids camp and kids church, whatever, I can still remember the songs. I still remember half the songs we sang at like kids camp growing up. Like, I think I'm gonna, th partly because I would like fake throw up on my friends. Cause like, I think I'm gonna throw up bleh, my hands and praise the Lord. It's like, you know, um, and, uh, like Matthew 28, 19 and 20, that's how I know that scripture is because of the song, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, that's the great commission. That, that's how I know that scripture is because of that song at kids camp. That's, that's been stuck in my mind forever. So, um, music involves the listener in the learning process, okay, which is, which brings, uh, some thought to if there's any way that you can connect the themes of worship to what you're speaking that day, that's a huge win. That's an absolutely huge win because the kids will probably walk away with some part of what you spoke, but the song is what's going to like get nestled down in them. And they're going to like be singing that five days later, be like, what, why did that? You know, you get a song stuck in your head. You're like, why is that stuck in my head? And then it like brings back memories, right? We met, we talked, touched on really briefly earlier how music has been used with Alzheimer's patients and really helped um, in that capacity. And really, it's a memory. It, it's a memory uh, tool. Um, another thing, I, j I actually just thought of this in the last couple of weeks, and it seems kind of silly uh, to use in church, but you know, all the commercials, almost every commercial. Okay, next time you watch TV. Oh, open your eyes and see how many commercials do this out of like 10 commercials have like a little jingle. It could be vocal. It could be just a little instrumental hook at the end of the commercial, right? All the insurance companies nationwide is on your side, right? Chicken parm, you taste so good, right? Whatever that ad is with, with Peyton Manning. Um, do I really look like this? It's hilarious. But the, the reason I remember that is because there's that little teeny musical period at the end of what they said. And because I can remember the musical period, I can remember that entire ad. So if you think about it, what would it look like if we, and it doesn't have to be, and you don't have to be musical at all. You could say, la 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 and that could be your period that you put on the end of you say okay every time i say this phrase which could be the bottom like you know jesus loves you no matter what la 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 and make the kids say that jesus loves you no matter what la 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 and they'll laugh and they'll think it's funny but they'll remember it because there's a musical hook on the end of it that they'll remember and they'll remember that was goofy that was fun and then what oh yeah jesus loves me no matter what la 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 and right what would that look like um uh, 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 on the note of teaching aids, I've had the, the total blessing to be able to lead worship at our um, network kids camp on the west side. I need a song to help me remember the directions because I always have to. Um, on the west side uh, for the last couple of years. And all right. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Got it. Um, and and we made it uh, a huge a light critical point to to write a theme song that matches the theme of the camp because for kids because camp is such a like a huge thing in the lives of kids um t for them to be able to attach all of the god moments and all of the memories and all the fun times and all the 
you know, prayers that get answered. I'm, I'm sure we could sit and tell stories about what God does in kids' lives at camp, but for them to attach all that to a song, it's just like what we talked about with attaching a, a musical period at the end of your bottom line. That's that's what we do at camp is we've taken this theme song that they're able to attach at the bo- at the end of all those memories, and hopefully that theme song gets stuck in their head and 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 that they walk away if they walk away with nothing else but that song that song is going to remind them of everything god that god did that week um uh i don't remember where where i got this from um but just a little equation that says recognition plus association equals power i mean that that would kind of sum up what we've been talking about like a little musical hook on the end of something recognition association like there, there's your power to remember something and be engaged in something. Um, family impact, okay? Um, <laughs> what are the two questions parents always ask their kids when they pick them up on a Sunday or a midweek? What'd you do? What'd you learn? And yeah, pretty pretty much. So, um, and it's the most discouraging thing in the world because we like pour our heart out to the kids and as soon, like they're like barely out the door and we hear like the parent asking that question and we're like, oh, 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 like I saw them, they were listening today and uh, they're going to get it and they're going to blow their parents away and their parents are going to be so like glad that their kid is here and think so highly of our kid's ministry and the kid's like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> um, but, but, <coughs> um, if, if we've done, if we've creatively attached music to what we talk about, the kid's going to be singing that song in the car on the way home, in the car on the way to school, and their parents will be like, where'd you learn that song? Like, oh, from church, right? And it, who knows, it might even bring up memories of what they've been learning. I can't tell you, actually, just, just two weeks ago, one of our parents said, and, and I can't believe I haven't done this yet, um, one of our parents said, hey, do you like have a CD or like any way that I can get this kind of the songs of which you guys do on Sundays? And I was like, no, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to start publishing that. Um, and part of it, um, for us at least, is we have some high schoolers that do a, a great job of leading worship, but they, they kind of pick the songs the morning of. They say, oh, let's do this one, this one, this one, okay, which, which whatever. But if they're picking the songs the morning of, it makes it hard for me to publish it. So to do that, on the administrative end, I got to sit, I got to create, and we're going to get to this, we're going to talk about set lists and f- dial in on worship in a little bit. Um, but I have to sit down with them and say, okay, I need you to pick the songs ahead of time because I, because I want to be able to shoot out YouTube links to our parents and our kids and have kids, you know, involved. We, we kind of pull kids up on stage for our worship team anyway, but they don't really, you know, they kind of half know the songs and they end up goofing off. Um, but, you know, imagine what it would look like if we're if we're saying, "Hey, parents, this week, this Sunday, hear the songs we're singing. You know, play them. Here's YouTube links, whatever." Um, and then the kids come; they know the songs already. They've been singing them all week, driving their parents crazy. And and then you know, you, you say, "Hey, you know, why don't you come on worship? You can worship team." The kids know it, and it's a it's a it's a touch point. It's another connection point between you guys and parents. And whenever you can do that, whenever you can connect parents to what you're doing on Sundays, huge win, right? Because if what you're doing on Sundays, there's no mention or, or conversation about it during the week, it's, a, it's hard to make that really hit and sink in the hearts of kids. So music is, is a way to, to, really, to really get a connection point with your parents. Um, <laughs> there's, um, there's something we did. Um, we, do a, we call it Vacation Bible Adventure. Everybody kind of has a different name for it. Essentially, it's Vacation Bible School. Um, and I'm sure, you know, all of you guys at some level do some summer or whatever. It's on a Sunday or maybe you do like a big week long vacation Bible school. And I spoofed. I don't know if you've ever heard the Red Hooded Sweatshirt song. I think Adam Sandler wrote it way back. Just a goofy, you know, I love you sweatshirt, dip, 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 sweatshirt, shamalama, ding dong, something like that. Um, s- super goofy, super hilarious. Um, and we spoofed it uh, and we called it the white like white t-shirt song and the whole week in VBA I was talking about this white t-shirt that my mom gave me and I loved it and I cherished it and it was my favorite thing in my whole closet and then I spilled I did the like the iodine and the film solution trick so I spilled iodine on it and the kids were like no 
right? Because they're like, oh, it's his favorite thing. And then, right, I used it as an opportunity to talk about Jesus and how he forgives us, and you pour the film solution on it, and you kind of rub it, and the stain goes away. Um, but <clears throat> all that to say is I, as I spoofed that song, and I, you know, sang it on stage as the white, you know, my big white T-shirt. Um, and two years later, uh, that was, two, that was two, th- almost three years ago now, kids like parents are still like are you gonna do the are you gonna do the you know the my big white t-shirt song this year because my kids loved it and and this is before I'd stumbled onto some of this stuff but what I realized that's what we were talking about earlier I put I put a musical period on the gospel message through this goofy song talking about my white t-shirt which of course represents us and how much God loves us and it stuck with kids they're still sometimes on Sundays they're like they're walking down like and they start singing the song and I'm like that was two years ago how on earth, like, you can't even remember when I tell you to sit down and zip your lips, like, five seconds later. How do you remember that? And I've realized over the last couple years, it's music. It's this wonderful power of music um, that God has given us this gift and this, this free, essentially, it's this free resource with immense power to be able to use in our ministries and our environments. That's a huge memory tool, et cetera, so forth. Um, Anyway, uh, okay, so <clears throat> let's let's end um, just talking about worship. Can I kind of ask? Does anybody in here like lead worship um, on on kind of Sundays, or or maybe you are like in charge or over the worship team, and you kind of have to help them and coach them a little bit? Is there anybody in here that's not musical at all, and you're just like, I'm trying to figure out how to how to do some stuff like this? Okay, okay, so. Um, this is just stuff that I've discovered along the way. Um, this is uh, Eric's musical life lessons, I guess, that are just from experience. And they might be different in your church, but I think some of these things are universal. Um, when you're picking songs for kids, I think a lot of us will always, I, I, I'm sure most of us could say, we've got, you know, maybe our girls are engaged, but most of our boys kind of sit on the wall and they, they're kind of like whatever and they don't they're not engaged that's what's true for us anyway our girls are really engaged a small you know maybe 25 percent of our boys are but the most of our boys are like I'm too cool for this I don't care whatever I'll you know start throwing candy in the games and I'll be in for that but but not for the singy stuff and I think part of that um okay let's let's go backwards I I heard a, a parable of sorts one time about Japanese and American automakers and there were some American automobile makers, you know, Chevy, Ford, whatever, and they were touring a Japanese um, a car, you know, production plant, and um, they're watching, you know, the assembly line and this and this and this, and the American automakers are like, where's your guy at the end of the assembly line to like, uh, you know, kind of like to, to, to bang the doors to make, to make sure they fit, because with the American assembly line is, and this is a parable, but, um, you know, the, the cars came through, and the doors didn't fit quite right, so they had to have a guy with a rubber hammer just to kind of tap the doors to make sure they, they were all aligned, and the Japanese guys were like, we, we don't have one. We, we designed it to work from the beginning, um, and so all this to say, in terms of our worship, I think sometimes we get to our elementary kids, and we're like, why aren't they engaged? Why don't they get this? And when we need to be thinking, okay, I need to be looking to my preschoolers and starting worship here and talking about worship with them at a preschooler level and doing worship with them. Because if you have, you know, kids come from nursery to preschool and they don't really do any worship, maybe they sing like Jesus loves me once or twice in their classroom when they're getting their snack or something. And then they get to elementary and then we expect them to be involved in this, you know, two, three, four song set list with these big words and whatever. Like, I don't because they're still learning. Um, kids are still so really, really learning kind of what, what worship is and what the significance of it is. So for us, that, that's the realization we came to. It's like, why isn't our elementary kids, why aren't they getting this? Why aren't they engaged? Like, you know, they're, they're fun songs, blah, blah, blah. But our boys are kind of out of the, out of it. <coughs> um, and um, so we just started a, um, like a, a preschool worship time where we gather, we kind of have our twos, threes, fours, and kindergarten, and we gather them all in a room, and we have some DVD worship, and we've um, found a, a, a couple leaders to help us lead it. And man, so we've been doing that for about a, mm, two months. And the second week, the second week we did it, right? Okay, and if you want to talk about a short attention span, forget elementary kids, let's talk about preschoolers for a second, right? Um, and the second week we did it, one of the little, like, three or four-year-olds was, like, trundling into the room, like, following, like, uh, like in their, like, imaginary train, 
Um, and they were singing the song, one of the songs we'd done the week before. They'd only done it one time, one Sunday before, and they remembered it. Preschooler, three or four-year-old. There's something here, guys. There's there's something here that we can really tap into and use. So, anyway, so I'm gonna focus the rest of the the conversation, and I'm I'm about done, so we can kind of chat and share ideas and ask questions, um, in a little bit. Um, I see we need to be out of here by nine well, ten fifteen. I'm not sure. Is that does that sound right? Yeah, ten fifteen. Okay, so we're d- we're doing all right. Um, okay, so I'm going to focus the rest of this on on ele- on the elementary end, but some of these principles absolutely apply are are, are universally applicable. Um, so, um, in picking songs for kids, I think this is a really simple thing, but this could be one of the reasons why our kids aren't engaging in worship um, because we haven't put enough thought into the songs that we're picking. Um, this is my least favorite part of leading worship, like for camp or like a kids event. I, I hate putting the set list together, but it's the most significant part because if we're picking songs that are, and especially with early elementary, like first, second grade, some of these kids are still kind of like learning how to read good. Um, uh, and uh, they're so like fast songs with a lot of words, they're like, okay, and the song's over. Um, and it's totally lost on them. And And so... Uh, <clears throat> when we pick songs, let me say this. If we're picking songs that are too wordy, too complicated, too abstract in their words and their uh, uh, whatever, as, and ki- that essentially that eliminates the kids from engaging it because they don't understand, especially elementary kids. They always want to know why, right? That's a human tendency. We always want to know why. We like to know why, but you see it really strong in, in kids. So if they don't understand why, why we worship, you know, why do we do this, um, and, and they can't make sense of the words. They're going to be like, I don't understand it, therefore I don't like it. And then you're going to end up with the kids sitting on the side. And the, the, the bummer about that too is what you're teaching kids is that worship is confusing, worship is boring, and uh, you know you can fill in some, some other words there. So as you look for songs, even if you're not musical, this, this is, this is a pr- some pretty simple guidelines. Um, if you don't know what the word means, if you can't articulate it to like, a preschooler almost, you probably shouldn't do the song unless you're willing to explain. And it's not a bad thing to explain before you sing a song. Say, hey, kids, this is this is what hallelujah means. Some, sometimes those mo- teaching moments are good if you're a strong leader or if you have strong leaders. But otherwise, don't, don't do a song that is half just hallelujah because kids are like, I don't even know. I don't even know what this is. Um, or, or, um, like some of the, uh, I guess it's not that new anymore, but the Hillsong Young and Free albums, like Wake, um, Alive, great, I love it. But for kids, so many words, some big words, and the words are put together really fast. Um, And it's really hard for kids to follow. Essentially, all they get out of it is just jumping and shouting a couple words, and and it's kind of lost on them. Um, uh, Duration of the song, if it's more than four minutes, either find some software or ask your media guy to, Hey, can you like chop this and fade it out for me or don't do it? There's some songs, um, that like, especially slower songs, like, you know, they're really, um, you know, like the stand, that's an older Hillsong song, you know, used to before creation, eternity in your hands, yada, yada. There's some recordings of that. that are like seven minutes long. Okay. Let's be honest. Like what kid is, what adult is going to be engaged in a seven minute song? So, um, so for kids, four minutes or less for, I, I, from my experience, four minutes is kind of like the top end, um, of it. Um, keep the number of words to a minimum. So if there's a song that has like three verses, which would also add to the duration. That means it has a lot of words, and there's a lot of concepts and notions going on in that song. And that will make it difficult for the kids to understand it, for the kids to engage in it. And really, it's kind of difficult for your worship team to lead it. So you're kind of, you know, it could be setting them up to fail. Um, here's a huge one, okay? If, if you go home and nothing, and these are the only two things you take away to use either as a worship leader or to give to your worship teams, these two things are huge. Keep your eyes open and smile. Okay, so here, here, here's why I say those two things are huge. First of all, in, in adult worship, we close our eyes as a way to kind of be introspective and focus on God, which isn't a bad thing. Um, and, but with worship leaders, if, uh, if, especially with kids, if your eyes are closed, you've disengaged with the kids. Eye contact is a huge, 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 huge thing. 
um, which is why, right, in public speaking, right, you know, it's bad if you, like, zone in on one person because they feel, like, singled out, and they're like, what? Or if you don't look at any, like, if the whole time I'd been, like, looking at the ceiling when I was talking with you guys, you'd be like, what is wrong with him? So if your worship leader's doing the same thing, or if I was like, yeah, so anyway, worship and music, blah, 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 you'd be like, what the, what? Um, so with your worship leader, eye contact with the kids is huge because part of what that's doing uh, um, is saying, hey, I see you. And I, and th- this seems like a lot to, to say just from eye contact, but to a kid, to a kid, you look at a kid right in the face because a lot of times they just get looked over like, yeah, whatever, and then whatever. But to spend, so, okay, so let me say this. As a worship leader, um, I haven't quite got there yet, but I've always wanted to be able to like lead kids camp. And when I lead, especially from behind an instrument, to not have to stare at the music the whole time. Because what I want to be doing, just like when I speak, I want to have my head on a swivel. And I want to be taking a couple seconds of eye contact, a couple seconds of eye contact, a couple seconds of eye contact while I'm smiling. Because what I'm communicating in that moment to that child is worship is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it's something that we do together, and I see you, and I'm smiling at you, right? I think sometimes um, in the mini worship leader from kids to adults, you see worship leaders that are engaged in the first song, and then they close their eyes, and they go right to this, which, okay, but they've lost that visual contact, which is so huge for kids. And the, my, uh, the, the biggest pet peeve, right, for me is, is smiling because... Uh, so much of our communication is nonverbal, especially with kids. And they're pretty good readers of it, right? Because they see it in their parents when their parents are busy and their parents are like, yeah, I'm listening, but they're like doing 14 billion other things. And the kid's like, nah, you're not really listening and you don't care about me. Um, but uh, if you don't smile when you're leading worship, for song selection aside, whatever, forget everything else I said. If you're not smiling when you're leading worship, um, you, you're, you're, you're missing, you're missing it. You're, you're missing it because you're telling the kids, I'm not enjoying this. This isn't fun. This isn't exciting. Meh. Right. Um, can you imagine presenting the gospel without smiling? It'd be, that'd be pretty hard. Uh, almost, almost impossible. Right. Or, or, um, you know, doing something really exciting. Like I'm at, I'm at, I'm at Disneyland. Right. Try to go to Disneyland and not smile at all. Um, right. So things that we're excited about, things that are worthwhile, things that hold value in our lives, we smile about, we smile at kids, we smile at, you know, pets, things in our lives that hold value. When we see somebody we care about, we smile at them. So why aren't we smiling when we lead worship? That should be like, you should like have like a Joker-esque grin, like glued to your face over the top. Kids, this is awesome. Jesus is exciting. Worship is exciting. I love doing this. You should love doing this. And as you're looking around the room and smiling at all the kids as you're singing, that's what you're communicating non-verbally, which is huge, which is huge. Um, okay, uh, back to a couple of little nuts and bolts and we'll spend the last mm, six and a half minutes in discussion. Okay. Engage the kids on the first song. If that means you're dripping in sweat, so be it. Engage the kids on the first song. Because if you don't have them there, it's just like speaking. If you, When you're preaching, if you don't catch them in the first 30 seconds, minute, 90 seconds, you've kind of lost them for the rest of the time because they've said, you're boring, I don't want to listen to you. And then they start flicking somebody's ear um, or, or whatever, or break dancing. Um, uh, so catch them in the first song, plan that first song. Well, make sure you know it, that you don't have to look on the, on at the screen, be over the top in energy and do everything you have to. If you have to stop the song and do like, all right, play Simon says really quick. And then say, okay, as we, as we sing, as we sing our first songs, we're going to keep playing this game. I'm not going to say anything. I want you to do everything that I do. Throw some still silly things in like picking your nose and you know, whatever. Um, but if, even if you have to stop the first song to get them engaged, to get the, some of the kids off the wall, do it. It's worth it. And what you're telling the kids is, Hey, I value your participation in this enough that I will stop what I'm doing and love them. You say, Hey, do this with me, do this with us. Right. Um, pray with your worship team or if your worship leader, pray, pray before you go out there. Okay. It, <laughs> we can't. Uh, it seems silly, right? We're doing the Lord's work and talking about God, but sometimes we never invite him to be a part of it. Um, and I'm, I'm so guilty of that. Um, so pray for two reasons, because you need God um, to, to be there and to be drawing those kids to him in worship. 
And on another level, it can be really discouraging to get up in front of kids Sunday in and Sunday out and for them not to be engaged and not responsive. And it takes time. All these things that we're talking about, you won't be able to go home and say, okay, we're going to change all this and it's going to be totally different today, right now. Do you do these? Yes, things will change, but it, it will be over time. Especially if you've done things totally different, it'll take the kids a little bit to kind of click in and, oh, they're looking at me and they're smiling at me during worship. This is weird. And then Sunday, the next Sunday, like, oh, this is normal. And then the third Sunday, like, oh, okay. And then the fourth Sunday, like, oh, okay. Right? Um, but for, for your sake and for the sake of the kids, pray. Pray pray as a worship leader. Pray for the kids. Pray pray for the people that lead with you. Um, as you're leading worship, um, good thing, fun things to do is take moments in songs and create memorable, uh, or take songs and create memorable moments. Okay. For example, the song, take it all, uh, by Hillsong, take, take, take it all, take, take, take it all. For us, our go-to motion, and probably for, you know, a lot of you, if you ever did this thing, we'd make the fist and we'd just like punch the sky, right? Take, take, take. That's a memorable moment. And so what I mean by that is a memorable moment that could be something that you do before the song, before any music's playing, before you say any words. And if I said, okay, I need everybody to stand up. Okay, everybody, take your hand, close it like this, and punch the sky three times. The kids know what's coming, right? I've set the expectation. Like, oh, take it all's coming. I get to punch the sky and be crazy, right? They know what's coming. I've set the expectation, and they know that I expect them when we get to that point in the song to participate with me. Okay, I've set the expectation, and I've tied it to the memorable moment in the song, okay? So, in you know, and it could be anything. There could be a, like an instrumental, like a big instrumental break in the song that you're leading. And that's always an awkward thing with kids because kids, they don't know, they haven't learned worship to be able to worship on their own yet. For adults, you get an instrumental break and we kind of take a moment to just kind of praise God on our own. Kids aren't there yet. So, so you need to kind of engage them in the stop gap. Otherwise you lose them halfway in the song. Take a moment and say, all right, five jumping jacks. Okay. That's the memorable moment in the song, in the instrumental, five jumping jacks. Okay. So I'm going with it. Um, I think the temptation with motions uh, is that there are more, there become more motions than words. Okay, I, that's true for us at least. Um, like I said, we have a great high schooler team, but they're all very engaged in drama, which they're very expressive, which is great. But they create so many motions. Sometimes I have to say, "Hey guys, hang on, slow your roll a little bit. Um, let's make this a little bit more realistic for the kids." Um, so that they can focus on singing the song instead of focus on what motion is next. I don't want to look like a goof. Um, so, um, okay. Um, that's, that's the book, what I have. And, um, I want to save the last couple minutes we have just, just to chat. So questions, comments, other ideas that I didn't mention, things that are working for you or that you've discovered the last, however, however many times ready to go. Yes, sir. We use tracks right now. Um, we're we're working towards hopefully um, by this by a year and a half from now we'll be live. But to make that transition is a huge because once we start it we don't want to go back. So we want to make sure we have the musicians in place to make it sustainable. Um, I I love live worship. I'm all about it. But we we yeah. So no, it's not live. It's on tracks, but it can still be good off tracks. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. That's a great way to do it. Or even do it around like major events, like do pull some musicians together. Say, hey, can you just help me out for Easter, right? Some musicians in your church or, you know, do something for Christmas. And that's, you know, that's where it starts. Um, and you can, you know, build from there for able. That's cool. That's cool that you guys get to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, we don't we don't really use DV. Uh, right. So when I say track, I mean just an audio, uh, just an audio track. DVD worship uh, I is okay. The problem I have with like DVD, meaning uh, assuming that there's something going on on the screen, um, is that it's kind of distracting because the kids end up watching like what they're doing. It's just like you know that that screen zombie face um, that kids get when they're watching something on a screen. Is it? it for us, at least, I feel like it, it has distracted from the worship. So we just we just use a, a, a presentation software. We have just a background and the lyrics over top. So for artists, um, yeah, um, it's hard because uh, even like 
kid specific artists i uh maybe i'm just really way too picky but i feel like even kid specific artists like yancey they're okay and there's some songs they have that are good i'll say this no artist will have release a cd and i'll say 100 percent every song in that album is good so however the majority uh and it's mostly upbeat songs but i found that planet shakers is really good for kids because for a couple reasons the songs are simple they're usually one verse or maybe two verse songs so verse pre-chorus chorus chorus, bridge really simple easy to easy to learn easy to memorize the lyrics um although for adults some uh the musician in me is like oh man they're stuck in the 90s but um the lyrics are very concrete for kids they're not um hill song has has for adults is great but it can air on the abstract side um you know you end up with those like abstract metaphors like um i can't remember the name of the song but it goes you know take me deeper where my feet uh could never want kids are like oh. yes thank you uh, that like that will be totally lost on a kid because there's c- concrete thinkers right you know especially younger kids you say i'm so hungry i could eat a cow and they're like no don't eat a cow um, right, not so much of the older elementary think students, but I'm I'm saying that a lot of the euphemisms and uh, um, um, euphemisms is the right word. The language that's used, the poetic language, kind of goes over their head. So I found that Planet Shakers works really well. Um, oh, you know, I can give you my email address. I should have. I totally. I just thought of this right now. I should have brought the set lists that we've used at kids camps for the last two years because we labored over over picking some of those things. So, um, if if you want that, just connect with me and I can email that to you um, a- after the fact. 